Well, here we are in James 1, 16 through 18, on a subject you very seldom hear anything about in, the, in our culture. Uh, James introduces us to plant, uh, planned fatherhood. Now, in our culture today, we hear a lot about planned parenthood. Not only in our culture, but many of the, the cultures of the world, they talk a great deal about planned parenthood. These same cultures talk very little about planned fatherhood, and yet that's the subject of James, one of many subjects that James writes about in chapter 1, 16 through 18. He, he starts with a warning. Remember, it was a bridge between what he had discussed and what he was about to discuss. Verse 16 is a bridge. Do not err. Do not stray away from the truth. And it's, a, it's an imperative. It's a command, and it's a, given as a warning. Do not be deceived. It's really interesting. The word in the Greek language is a really interesting word because it is the English word for planets. Plantano. And it means wandering. A wandering. A wandering in space. And so he tells you to be careful about wandering with no purpose. Wandering uh, away from the truth, and when you get from the truth, you get in uh, to unknown territories of your life, things that you, places you shouldn't be, things you shouldn't be doing, and it's just an interesting concept. You can see how the English has struggled with it. I forget what the King James said, but maybe stray, uh, stray away, or. Um, maybe deceived or strayed away. It's a word, led astray. This is that word, but it's just interesting in, uh, the, in the English concept. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Uh, every good gift is actually what that should say. My Bible says every good thing, but it actually is the word gift. Every good gift uh, bestowed, every good thing bestowed, every good gift given, and every per perfect gift the word gift is used with both those words. It's a good gift. It's a perfect gift. Uh, and we'll talk about that at some later date. Every good, every good gift bestowed or given and every perfect gift, watch this now, both good and perfect gifts are from above. Every time God gives you something in your life, gives you something in your life, I don't care how you perceive it, it's a good gift, and it's a perfect gift for you. Have you not had over the years been given a gift you didn't really care about? And there's a struggle between the gift and the giver. You didn't really care about the gift, but you cared a lot about the fact that they gave you the gift. And so, as a rule, it falls back on the giver, and sometimes you get a gift, and you're so disappointed that it wasn't what you wanted that you make a scene. You often see children do that. They were looking forward so desperate for a certain type of gift, told everybody in the world what they wanted, and many movies uh, are built on the premise of that. And they have a fit over the fact that they didn't get what they wanted. They never considered that maybe you just lost your job or <laughs> whatever. But here's the thing about it. When God, listen, everything God gives you by grace, everything, I don't care what it is, when he hands it off to you, you know two things about it. It's a good gift because it's grace. And it's perfect for your time. It's perfect for your need. It is perfect. It has been perfectly selected for you at this point in your life. You can know that for certain. And so when you get a gift and you wanted something else, but God gave you what you needed, you have to make an adjustment, don't you? You have to say to yourself, that's a good thing. That's a good thing that's been bestowed on me and is perfect for my life at this point. See, if you understand that, then you understand Romans 8, 28. 
If you don't understand that, then you'd never understand Romans 8, 28. Agreed? All, right? All things work together for good. If you don't understand this principle, then you'd, you're not going to like, you, believe me, you're not going to like Hebrews 12, 7. You're not going to like Hebrews 12, 7. Because there are those times when the gift that he gives you is a spanking. It's a good gift. And it's a perfect gift because it comes from God's love for you. Because you were erring. He told you not to err. And you were erring. He told you not to be disrespectful and disobedient. You were. And Hebrews 12, 7 says, because he loves you, he disciplines you to bring you back into the path of righteousness. This is what James is talking about in James 1, 16 through 18. And then he picks that subject up. Notice he picks the subject up. He says, it comes, not only is it from above. Now watch this. Now do, verse 17. Not only is it from above, but it's coming down from the Father of lights. You know why? Because we sit in darkness. This whole world is about darkness. We're the lights in it. We're the lights in a world of darkness. You do know that, don't you? Ah. Well, you have forgotten that you were saved out of that domain of darkness. And now you walk in light. The Word of God is light. The Holy Spirit is light. Jesus is light. God is light. Everything about God's dealing with you is about light, not darkness. When you get in those funky moods of darkness, depressions and all that kind of stuff that goes on, and you get into that dark space in your life, I'm all alone, and nobody cares for me. Listen, you ought to sing the song, Nobody Cares for Me Like Jesus Cares for Me. Uh -huh. Don't sit and sing that lonely song because that's not true. That's a lie that you've bought into because nobody cares for you like Jesus cares for you. And the truth, nobody went to the effort to love you unconditionally as much as Jesus Christ. And so James is trying to bring this stuff together in our, in our souls when he says this thing that the, the, every gift is good that comes from God, that comes from above. By grace, every, every, every bit of that, and it comes down from the Father of lights. It's always about enlightening you. When God gives you a grace gift, no matter how you perceive it, perceive it as good and perfect for you for the time. And understand that it's been selected for you. It's, it's come from above and it's come down to you in a selective, caring, nurturing, selective way. And so the writer, the writer is telling us this. Then he says, with whom, talking about the father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. I mean, there, g g listen, what he means, there, there isn't even the shadow of darkness, right? Look, 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 come on, people. I mean, you can sit in the dark or in the shadow, Right? The shadow is nowhere near as dark as the dark. Agreed? <laughs> A small child woke up in the middle of the night, one that I knew, and the moonlight was coming through the window, and when the child got up, it was faced the other way, screamed bloody murder because they thought there was somebody in the room with them because when they stood up, the shadow hit the wall and every time, he, the, per, every time the child moved, the shadow moved with him. And he was convinced, in a split second, he was convinced that somebody was in the room with him, was going to get him, and he screamed bloody murder. That is not true with God. God is light in him. There is no darkness. Listen to me now. 
not even the shadow of darkness. Do you understand that? See, 1 John 1.5, 1 John 1.5 says that God is light. In him there is no darkness. James says not only is there no darkness, there's not even the shadow of it. Isn't that interesting? And if that, when I rushed in the room and turned them the other way, then the, the light, the light explained the darkness. Do you understand that? As soon as I turned him to look at the, light, the moon light and then said, now turn back and take a look. He looked back and he went, oh, hmm. And there's a teaching moment there. God is light. God is light. In him there's no darkness. James says not only that, but not even the shadow of darkness. Do you get that? So, look, at, often in our life we're paying attention to the shadow and fears get in our heart when the truth is if we turn to the Lord, we would find the light and the light is the answer to the shadow or the darkness. Why did he scream? He screamed because he saw a shadow of himself and didn't realize it and, and took it to outer space. <laughs> right? And when he... Let's have a word of prayer. <laughs> I hear you, Father. I hear you. I was just reading the text. I know, I got preaching. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come our way today to, to look at this passage of Scripture to understand its meaning that we might live in the light, in the power of that light. And when there, when there is any shadow of darkness in our life, may we understand Turn to the light. Turn to the word. The word is a light unto your path. It will bring comfort to your soul. Don't live in the fear of darkness. Be enlightened. Be in, enlightened. That is light inside. I pray today, Father, as we come to this message under the ministry of the Holy Spirit, you teach us great truths that would be relevant and prevalent to our life right now, today. We have so many people live in fear and depression and all that stuff. They live in darkness rather than light. Stop looking at darkness and turn and look at light. Look at what God has promised you. Look at what he'll do for you. The good gifts and the perfect gifts come from Above and they come down to us as the father of lights, not darkness. <clears throat> Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we are in verse 18, my text. <laughs> Do what? Turn the fans on. I don't really have any fans in my ministry, but I will turn the I will turn the overhead on. Huh? Yeah, right. Al says, more than I know. Well, the ones I know, I ain't got any. <laughs> Verse 18. Now watch this. Because in the exercise of his will is one word in the Greek. They're struggling with how to explain this to you. It's one word. It's bulamai. And bulamai is really interesting. And, and listen, it's in the Greek sentence, it's the first word. You always pay attention to the first word in the Greek. Whatever the what first word is, sometimes it's a conjunction, it's a trailer hitch, as I call it. You always pay attention. Now, this is really interesting because he stuck this baby right out there on number one. Bulamai. He says bulamai. And, and bulamai means something that your mind, your, mind, your mi mind has settled on as an absolute truth. Regarding God's plan and a will, connected with a will, a decreed will for your life. We call it the directive will around here. Things that God has spoken to your heart directly about. He has spoken to you about something that's really significantly important. It could be about your marriage. It could be about your family. It could be about your job. It could be about your ministry. It, it, it could, 
listen, it could be as simple as God speaking to your heart and say, I want you to sing praises to God. I want you to be part of the, the, the musical plan here. I want you to be part of the camp. I want you to be in the, you know, there's just a thousand and one things. They're all important. And, and, you, and you really need to pay attention to that, that exit. Now, the reason he says in the exercises of his will is the way it's used in the Greek syntax. And I'm going to show you that. But this is a powerful word. This, is, this means the mind has been settled on an absolute truth that you know that's been revealed to you and now requires the exercise of it. <clears throat> you know, we, around here we call that inhale, exhale out of 2 Timothy 3.16. You inhale it to exhale it. Well, this is Bulamai. Bulamai comes in as this is a decreed will of God for your life. <clears throat> and he gives you a scripture on it. And you go like, okay, I got it. And that becomes a settled faith issue with you. That issue is settled in my soul. That's Bulamai. Now, Bulamai requires the application of it to your life. For example, the shadow. You look back. You go, why did you go to fear? Why didn't you go to faith? Why did you walk by sight, not by faith, right? See, we all have those things. You, you walk in the doctor's office, and the doctor says, wow, you got wanga ganga. Nobody in the whole world has had wanga ganga. I don't tell you, I don't know how long you're going to live. And you say to him, I do. That's, listen, doc, that's not a problem with me. Because, listen, it's already been, my epithet has already been written, birth to death. God has all of that. The hard part is living. The hard part wasn't birth and it's not dying, Doc. The hard part is living it. Because God got both ends of this thing. God's got the, listen, he is Alpha and Omega, right? He's the beginning and the end. I got that down. It's the in-between that I'm struggling with in my life, Right? You do have that in your heart, don't you? Right. See, that somebody cast a shadow of doubt upon your life. The guy comes in and says, look, you've been a great worker, but I can't pay you anymore. I got to let you go. Now, what are you going to do with that? Well, listen, God's a guy who's in charge of, of divine institution free enterprise, Right? You stop and you say, listen, I don't know if I've, has there ever been a time I haven't been without a job? Now, I like what I'm doing, but listen, I've worked all my life. See, as a farm boy, I just figured anything's better than milking cows. <laughs> See, I, I gauge everything. I don't think I'm above that because that's the way I, I grew up. I don't think I'm above anything like that. But would I like to have anything, anything better to me as a farm kid? Anything was better than milk a cow by hand. I'm talking about hand. I'm not talking about this artificial stuff. I'm talking about where well, you got to squeeze it down to the last drop because mama don't like it unless you, you know. All right, bulamai, bulamai. Now watch what bulamai is after in verse 18. I'm still on verse 18. <clears throat> Listen, in the exercise of his will... Listen, watch this. Watch what he does. In the exercise of his will, he brought forth us. He gave us birth by the word of truth. The, the word the is not an original text. That's the reason it's crossed out. I put it, but I crossed it out. In the exercise of his will, he gave us spiritual birth. That's what he's saying. So that reason, why did God save you by grace through faith? Why did the Father of light reach down and pull you out of darkness so that you could live in the light, die in the light, be born in the light, live in the light, and die in the light? Why did he do that? Watch this. So that we might be, as it were, the first fruits among his creatures, his creation. This is what Paul talked about. This very thing Paul is talking about in 2 Corinthians 5.17. You know that passage? New creatures in Christ. New creatures in Christ. Every born again person has been born by the father of lights who reached into the domain of darkness in the, under the power of Satan and delivered them the moment he believed that Jesus died for his sins 
was buried and raised from the dead. God reached him. When he believed, he reached over there, pulled him out by grace, pulled him, delivered him out of darkness, and set him down in the kingdom of light. God did that. And he did it so that we could become the creatures, the born again in Christ who live in light and declare that God is light and in him there is no darkness. Do you know what a powerful message each of you have this morning? Do you have any idea? I hear people all the time say, well, Ron, I'm a little afraid to talk about that to other people. Why, why would that be true when they're in darkness and you got the flashlight? They're in darkness and you got a flashlight. Why, why would you not turn that flashlight on and help them? Some of us have a flashlight that's bigger than you can imagine. It takes two people to hold it. That's how bright that light is because you're, you're spiritually mature. Can you imagine? Listen, God didn't give us, didn't put the light of Christ in us to put it, put it, to hide it, did he? Put it under a bushel, under a basket, put it in a closet, turn it off and not turn it on. He didn't do that. Stop listening to the devil lie to you because he's in darkness and hates the light, right? So every time he convinces you that you shouldn't turn your light on to those in darkness, you know, sometimes you can look into it, you can, you, can, you can see in a person a need for prayer. Do you know that? You can see hurting people. Do you not see hurting people? I saw one the other day. I mean, I just looked in his eyes. I knew it. He brought Jane and food, brought the food to Jane and I. I said, we, we're Christians and we always have a custom that we pray over food before we eat. But son, I need to tell you, there's something in your life I need to pray for you today. When we have our prayer time for our food, I want to pray for you. But I don't know what it is. You don't have to share it with me. But if you want to, we can get this thing settled today. He said, well, maybe. And so he left and brought our food back. <clears throat> he said, Okay, I do have something. He looked around and dumped it. And as I heard him, I knew, you know, I knew just how quick this could be fixed in his life. I said to them, buddy, you have no idea what a day this is going to be in your life. I had a day like this in 1961. And I'm going to tell you what you have to do. And if you'll do it, that burden will be lifted. I wanted to sing, burdens are lifted at Calvary. So I told him. I gave him the good news. He went back. Brought me the check. I thought, I'm going to use this check. I said to him, there's a, a name at the top, and it, you want me to put my name on the bottom. Is that how this works? Listen, wait a minute. I said, is that your name up there? Waiter name, you know. He said, yes. And you want me to put my name down here? Right? Right. Suppose I don't. Who's going to pay for this? He said, well, sir, I would be stuck with the bill. I'd have to pay for it. I said, 
That's what I've been telling you today. I told you Jesus Christ has paid the debt. He paid this bill. He paid this bill. So that you don't have to. Somebody's got to pay the bill, don't they? Son, does somebody have to pay this bill? Yes, sir, somebody's got to pay that bill. Well, I'm going to pay the bill, but I want you to know that Jesus did this for you. <clears throat> See, it doesn't take much, does it? It did take nothing away from us. <clears throat> you don't understand that. See, I just knew there's a person that lives in darkness. I could see it. A person who lives in darkness is just burdened by it. I need you to know that burdens are lifted at Calvary. This went for a meal. But God had other plans, didn't he? I know you know this as well as I do. <clears throat> when you see somebody in darkness, you got to get the flashlight out. And I realized, I didn't go there for a meal only. But a destiny in the life of another person. I remember that well in my soul that somebody did that for me in the summer of 1961, and it changed my life. <clears throat> because that's kind of a God we serve. Let me show you a couple points on this. <clears throat> I want you to see, <clears throat> I wrote at the very top of your paper two important principles of Greek syntax. <clears throat> Don't fall asleep on me now. Just because I said Greek syntax, I'm still going to teach you. <clears throat> But there's something in this that's really important because my subject today is planned fatherhood. And here's where it comes. Notice at the top of your paper in bold print, in the exercise of his will, Bulamai, watch this, heiress, passive, participle, now but the singular masculine. That's a six-point identity. Every verb, every verbal structure has a six-point identity. I just gave them to you. Aorist, passive, participle, nominative, singular, masculine. That's what that stands for. Every verb has six. That's a six-point identity. <clears throat> and they're very important. That's why when I write them out, I do them this way for you. Because some people in here know the importance of the principle of Greek. <clears throat> now, that's a, if, if, there's an, if there's a participle, there has to be a main verb someplace that connects it. A participle is always connected to a main verb. Now watch this. This is important. In the exercise of his will, that's the word bulamai. He, the father of lights of verse 17, brought us forth, gave birth to us by the word of truth. See the word gave birth to us, brought us forth. That means spiritual birth. Notice it's an aorist, active, indicative, third person singular. That's your six points. Identity of a verb. <clears throat> Listen, that's the main verb because it's an indicative. An indicative or an imperative is a main verb. Are you with me? I'm just telling you this is, this is basic stuff. <clears throat> but here's what's important. That's the main verb. Remember, a participle, it, it's floating looking for a main verb. When it finds a main verb, it attaches itself like a fish and a fisherman. Right? When, they, when those two get hooked up, we got a meal. Ho hopefully. We did in Florida, anyhow, or down in the Gulf Shores. The guys went out and caught some fish and brought them home, and whew, that was good. So, now watch. But here's, the, here's Greek syntax. Watch this now. Pay attention. Look up here. Now give me a moment with you. Listen to me. Th this is basic principle. The action of the aorist participle precedes the action of the aorist indicative. In other words, bulamai pre precedes giving spiritual birth. You, you understand? And bulamai is dealing with the plan of God in eternity to past. That's the aorist tense of eternity to past. Aorist is a point in time, divorce from time. That's what it means. The plan of God, because it's about God, who is the he? In the exercise of his will, that is God, 
working off verse 17, the father of lights. In him there is no, not even the casting of a shadow. In the exercise of his will, that's the aorist tense of eternity past. N notice, a look down at point one. See, I set all that up. Because what you have in the two aorist, the aorist participle and the aorist indicative, is different points, different, different, different points of action in the plan of God. And I want you to see this because you're never going to see it in it. There's no way you could see that in English. There is no way you could see that. The aorist tense is unique to the Greek. Now, here's what this said. Look at point one. In our lesson text, James teaches that the plan of God established at the Eternal Life Conference before the foundation of the world, decreed that every member of the human race who believes the gospel of his son would be born from above, born from above, saved, by the grace through faith, word of truth. And, of course, we know that to be 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Jesus died on the cross for our sins, according to the Scripture, was buried and was raised, according to the Scripture, on the third day, uh, Romans 1, 16. The power of the gospel is to those who believe the power of salvation. And Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. It's a gift. All right? So what I did is I took bulimai for you to show you the dynamics of the Greek syntax that show you. And when we have the aorist, uh, aorist passive participle of bulimai, notice the aorist takes you back to a point. It, listen. You say to me, how do you know that we're talking about eternity past? I'll tell you why. Ephesians 1, 4, and 5. In Ephesians, 4, in Ephesians 1, 4, and 5, it says that God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. That's what it says. In order to redeem us. That's how I know that. And listen, this is not the only place it's found. It's found all over the New Testament. So the aorist tense here takes us back to eternal life conference. When, before the foundation of the world, when God laid out the whole plan, the plan of God comes out of eternity past. That's why our salvation is from above and comes down to us at some point in our experience. That's true with the word of God, created in the past. When we walk by faith, it becomes dynamic at a point in time in our life, right? Thank you. You don't always have to say that, but uh, that's good. See, that's the aorist tense of preceding the action of being born again. What came first, the chicken or the egg? The, see, the plan of God came in eternity past. is now plays out in the reality of our life. It plays out in our life. It plays out in our life. That's how this thing plays out. The passive voice is the, decree, the decreed spiritual birth from above. That's the passive. The plan of God is now actively engaged from above. That's grace. It's actively engaged. He is active. The exercising of his will. That's the passive voice. The exercising of his will. The exercising of his will. That's that part. And it, our spiritual birth is from above. Listen, Jesus told that to Nicodemus in John, the third chapter. In the English, in John 3, 3, it says you must be born again. Mm-mm. It doesn't say born again. That's a principle. That's not, that's not the truth. The truth is he did not say born again, that, but that's actually what he meant. What he said is you've got to be born from above. You can't, you, and born from above means you've got to be saved by grace, not by works. And once you do that, then you live by grace through faith, and that works. See, it's a passive voice. And I, re I wrote, wrote down some words, that you, some scriptures you, you ought to pay attention to, like John 3.3, 3, John 3.7, John 3.10. Those are really dynamic passages. You need to read the word of God. One of the great failures of the Christian life is failure not to read the word of God. It is light unto it. Listen, Psalms 119 says that it is the light unto your path. And you know what your path is? Is involved in decisions. Your path is making a lot of decisions day in and day out, day in and day out, and they need to be compatible with the plan of God. 
We are children of God. We are, we are not our own. We've been bought with the price of the cross of Jesus Christ. The participle, the participle means that we should pay attention to what bulamai means. It's called the mood of the ver verb, and it refers to a mind settled on the word of truth regarding meeting the need of our salvation. That's what the subject was about. And what do we need to be saved from? Adam's sin. Thirteen judicial charges of Adam's sin is what we need to be saved from. We cannot save ourselves. We can only be saved through God's Son, who was a sufficient sacrifice for the justice of God to pardon us and give us mercy and grace. And why did God do that? Out of love. Out of love. I mean, I don't know who would ever be motivated by love to do all that unless you understand love from a different category than what people deal with. I mean, love in a human realm is, is cheap. They'll bail on love in a heartbeat. It's either my way or the highway. What's that say about love? I, they'll bail in a heartbeat. Listen, God will never do that. Unconditional love. God so loved the world, that's the love of God. That he sent his son. That whoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's a promise from the heart of God. That's a promise from the heart of God, not just the Bible. It's a promise from the heart of God. Now, what kind of love is that? That's not a love that we're familiar with. I mean, you, you cross me up, pfft, we're done. What is that? That's not unconditional. That's conditional. The love that God is talking about, the, in Romans 5, time it says, he says, that at the moment you believe, listen to me, Romans 5, 5 says, the moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, listen to this now, God poured out his love into our hearts. The love of God was poured out into our hearts. And in the fifth chapter, Romans 15 through 17, he says, and the spirit witnesses to our spirit that we are born into the family of God and that we belong to God forever. When we believe, he pours the love of God, that love that loved you to send his son is now poured into your heart and witnesses to your spirit that you are a child of God and God is your Abba Father. Oh my goodness, that in the fifth chapter, verse 8, and then the eighth chapter, verse 15, that thing is locked up. And that's the love we're to love one another with. In fact, if you're a Christian and you're married, you're to love your wife with that love. This is, listen, the world does not understand. You know when the world takes agape, they put conditions on it. They, 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 they take this love that God, God's word, they take it over here and they, they apply it in darkness. When you apply it in darkness, it's always out of fear. It's all, all, always out of self-interest. It's always wrong. It's always conditional. You can always tell when it's not God's love, no matter what they say out of their mouth, when it's not unconditional. When there's conditions on it, it's not God's love they're talking about. It, it's not, listen to me, it may be, it may be what they're talking about. <laughs> but it's not being what's being exercised by his will. Now the word, the main verb is the word gave birth. Apokueo. This is the main verb, and it results in a historical point in time. See, when we had the aorist participle, that aorist was eternity past. This aorist is at a point a point in real time, real time. You remember when you got saved? You, if you don't remember, I can tell you, you got saved in real time. Now, the plan of God to save you came out of eternity past. But the indicative, the aorist active indicative, the indicative is the mood of reality. 
historical reality. The plan of God is being exercised. The plan of God dealing with salvation, the moment you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day, the moment you do that, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. At that point, the reality of what had been planned for you and the death of Christ on the cross and all of that business is now reality in time. And when you plug into time, gospel time, it leads you into eternal life. You see the exchange? You, were, you came into human lifetime you accepted the gospel and he connected human lifetime with eternal lifetime. So that when you die, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Scarborough, isn't that right? But there are a lot of choices you can make in this life, but that's the best one you'll ever make because that involves eternity. To be absent from the body, 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. I mean, what a, how did you get that deal? Well, I worked hard to get that deal. I, I, no, you didn't. You believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and got in that deal. That deal was set in stone in eternity past. I mean, there's nothing we can't face. Romans 8, chapter 35 through the end of the chapter says there's nothing in your life that you can't face because the love of God, the love of God, the love of God will hold you, will hold you to... Throughout eternity, the love of God, the love of God, the moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, that love of God that was poured out into your heart and gave witness to your spirit, there is nothing, there is nothing in this world that can remove that. Nothing. What can separate us from the love of Christ? Listen, I'll tell you what he says. He goes through a whole list, but the bottom line is nothing. Absolutely zero. How comforting that is. How comforting that is. Every funeral I go to, buddy, I'll tell you, when, I, when the family says that person, I believe that person believed the gospel of Jesus Christ, how comforting is that is for me and for them? I mean, there's a twinkle in both of our eyes. When we have that conversation, I know, I know my daddy, I know my mama, I know my grandma, I know they're in heaven with the Lord. I know that, Ron. I mean, I mean, that becomes, that becomes quite a moment. It becomes quite a moment to the guys doing the funeral, I can tell you that. It becomes quite a moment. So in this era tense of giving birth, here's this era's point. This era's point, the first era's point is for Christ to come into the world. Galatians 4.4, 4. that first heiress point of giving birth, Jesus has to come into the world. He's got to die on a cross, be buried, and raised from the dead. That's the first heiress dance. That's Galatians 4.4. 4. Not in your paper, but that's Galatians 4.4. 4. It came at the right time in, in, in history. Christ was born of a woman, you know, born under the law. To do what? To redeem mankind, to redeem us. Romans, the fifth chapter, verse 6 says, at, at just the right time. You ought to write that down. There, that, that's a t-shirt if I ever saw it. Everything in the plan of God from the point of salvation on, listen, in the eternity plan, it was always at the right time. But once you enter the plan of God, now that becomes absolutely important to your life. At the right, everything in your life is at the right time. Everything in your life is at the right time. Everything in your life is at the right time. There is nothing that is not at the right time. And that ought to make you happy to know that you are right on target and whatever is coming and going in your life is a good gift, a perfect gift, and I'm okay. I'm okay. Oh, I hope you, I hope you understand that. The active is the voice of volition. When you believe the gospel, this becomes your package, the package of salvation. The indicative is the reality. From Christ on the cross to me, acceptance of the gospel, Christ on the cross, that historical event. I look back. See, I don't look back into the Old Testament to give me assurance of myself. I look to the cross of Jesus Christ, a historical event. I look to Calvary, Golgotha, Christ, Jesus Christ. 
In the Old Testament, it was Christ. In the New Testament, it's Jesus Christ. He, J Listen, Mary said, you call his name Jesus for he saved save his people from their sins. In the Old Testament, he wasn't called Jesus in the Old Testament. He's going to be called Christ, the, the Messiah, the anointed one to come. We call him, and listen, after he was raised from the dead, we call him the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he's returned to all of his glory as a member of the Godhead. I don't know. That's pretty good stuff. And what do we get out of this whole deal? God is our Abba Father. You know what Abba Father? That's interesting. Aramaic and Greek. And he didn't say, he didn't say Ab. That would have been enough. Hebrew would have been satisfied just to call him Ab. They called him Abba. I mean, he doubled up on that thing. He doubled up it. I can't tell you how important that is. I don't have enough time today to tell you how important that is. But that's pretty important. He called him Abba Father. And the best thing we can get to that understanding, I mean, see, Abba Father is a crying out for that foggy that father figure in your life. See, Abba Father is a, we would call that in, vocab, in our discussion today, we would call that a, a father figure that was important to my life. But when you got Abba on the front, you know what they have? You have a child that cries for Daddy. And daddy always responds. It's not just a baby who cries for daddy and never gets a daddy. It's not a baby who cries and has a need for daddy and never has a daddy. That's not it. This is, this is, this is a, a, a person who cries out unto God, cries as a child to a parent, and that parent has promised to meet that need. See, children don't cry for, they cry out of needs. When needs aren't met, then they cry out, of, they, they can cry out of wants. But this Abba Father is a child crying for a need. That baby wanting milk, a baby wanting her diaper change. It's a specific need that the child says, I have need. And that, therefore, we understand this, that God will take care of your what? Needs. And listen, if you grow spiritual enough to really get interested in this relationship that you have with God, see, you have it whether you're interested in it or not. You were born in the family of God whether you have interest in it or not. But if you get interest in this, he'll start taking care of your wants. But you got to have, listen, it requires a lot of maturity. He'll move you from needs to wants. He told Solomon that. Did he not tell Solomon that? Absolutely, he told him that. And not only that, but he told Solomon, I would, listen, I would have given you something. You asked the right thing, but I, listen, I was prepared to give you way more than that, right? But I'm going to tell you something. You asked for the right thing that's going to carry the whole package. But I was prepared to give you, Solomon, because you're thinking my way. You're talking my way. You're living my way. Listen. I'd have filled your heart f full of the thing. I would have given you stuff you would have never asked for. Just to show you how much I love you. Because you're asking, you're asking the right questions. You're, you're living the right way with me. Well, people, are you doing that? Are you there yet? Listen, it's okay if you're not there. Look, look, look. It's okay if you're not there yet. But you should be, that should be where you're moving to. Look. Are you born again? Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day? Do you believe that for the source of your salvation? Listen, if you don't believe that, you're not going to get saved. Jesus said, listen, if you go on and read the rest of my, my lesson, be sure to read John 10. Because he says, I am the only door to God. People really get upset with me. They really get upset with me when I say that. Oh, I don't believe that. 
that's a pretty narrow way of thinking. Yeah. But listen, here's what you're missing, buddy. That, that door to be for Jesus Christ, he spent six hours on the cross suffering for the sins of the world and the condemnation of it. He spent three days and three nights in Sheol so that you could have the privilege to walk in by grace through faith and not of yourself. It'd be a gift. If that's a narrow way, so be it. But I don't know what you mean by narrow. But that is the way it had, had to happen. I don't call that a narrow way. I call that a tough way. There's a lot of things in that. I don't know what you mean by narrow. You must be talking some kind of theology business. I'm talking gospel. That was no, that was no simple, easy way. Six hours on the cross dying for the sins of the world, suffering. Three days and three nights in the heart of the earth in Sheol to be raised from the dead, to give you salvation by grace through faith, that's not a narrow way. I'm tired of hearing people say that to me. I'm tired of hearing that. There's nothing narrow about that. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for these to come our way today and study with us, trying to get some of the simplistic things understood about God's love and grace and mercy. What a wonderful father you are. Planned fatherhood. Who would ever believe? I'm part of planned fatherhood. Now, for me, this is really significant. God never had a father until I met God. Now, I had a great, let me tell you, Father, I had a wonderful grandfather. And he was a wonderful male figure in my life. But he was a grandfather, and he was grand. But until I met God, I never had a father. And so this is really, a lesson like this is significantly important to me. It plays a much, probably a much larger role in my life than maybe others. I want to thank you. What a wonderful plan that works by grace, not by works. A wonderful plan out of eternity past that you formed that included me and all of these people with me today and by the internet. And I thank you for the time that they've given me to share this important message with them. In Jesus' name, amen.